24th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Welcome to Liturgy Prep for the 24th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Have you ever found yourself trapped in a locked room with no way to get out? Well, I have, and let me tell you, it's not fun. In this Sunday's Gospel, Jesus speaks of the parable of the unforgiving servant who refuses to forgive his fellow servant. When we refuse to forgive, it's like being trapped in a locked room. We become imprisoned in our resentment and our bitterness. On the other hand, when we forgive, we are free to love. We know that it's good for us to forgive, but that leads us to the question of how do we forgive? The first thing that we need to do is to ask the Holy Spirit who it is that we need to forgive. After that, we can say the following, in the name of Jesus, I forgive, then say the person's name, for, then state whatever it was that hurt us. This formula is good because we cannot forgive on our own. Forgiveness is supernatural and it goes beyond our nature. And that's why we say, we forgive in the name of Jesus. During this next week, I encourage all of us, including myself, to ask the Holy Spirit if there's anyone that we need to forgive. Forgiveness frees us to be who we were made to be, children of our Father who reflect in our darkened world the radiant light of God's love. God bless you. Sirach, chapter 27, verse 30 to chapter 28, verse 7. Forgive your neighbor's injustice, then when you pray, your own sins will be forgiven. Wrath and anger are hateful things yet the sinner hugs them tight. The vengeful will suffer the Lord's vengeance, for he remembers their sins in detail. Forgive your neighbor's injustice. Then, when you pray, your own sins will be forgiven. Could anyone nourish anger against another and expect healing from the Lord? Could anyone refuse mercy to another like himself? Can he seek pardon for his own sins? If one who is but flesh cherishes wrath, who will forgive his sins? Remember your last days, set enmity aside, remember death and decay, and cease from sin. Think of the commandments, hate not your neighbor, remember the Most High's covenant, and overlook faults. The Word of the Lord Sirach was written between 180 and 175 d. Sirach was written in Hebrew by a Jew named Yeshua ben Sirah, it was then translated by his grandson in Egypt. The surname Sirah means, the thorn in Aramaic but in Greek is translated as Sirach. Ben Sirah was a scholar, and a scribe, well versed in the law, especially in the books of wisdom. The early Greek church fathers referred to Sirach as, the all-virtuous wisdom. Sirach's work was not accepted into the Jewish biblical canon. It was included in the Septuagint, or Greek Old Testament and is accepted as part of the biblical canon by Catholics and Eastern Orthodox, but not by most Protestants. Sirach is a collection of ethical teachings which closely resembles Proverbs. Today's reading brings to mind, the old saying, when you seek vengeance you should dig two graves, one for your victim and one for yourself. Romans chapter 12 verses 19 to 21, Beloved, venge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemy is hungry, feed him, if he is thirsty, give him drink, for by so doing you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil but evil but overcome evil with good. In today's reading verses 3 to 5 are contradictions in logic. Verse 3 If you hold anger toward your neighbor how can you expect God to reward you with healing? Verse 4 If you refuse mercy to other humans how can you expect God to show you mercy? Verse 5 How can you expect God to sins when you are continuing them by being angry, furious, or vengeful toward your neighbor? Both verses 6 and 7 begin with the word remember which presupposes the student, the listener knows the commandments and realizes that his earthly life will come to an end and with the end, judgment. It is also a reference to chapter 7 verse 30-36, In whatever you do, remember your last days, 
and you will never sin. An unforgiving spirit has eternal consequences. Weak people revenge. Strong people forgive. Intelligent people ignore. Albert Einstein is kind and merciful, slow to anger and rich in compassion. The Lord is kind and merciful, slow to anger and rich in compassion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all my being, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. The Lord is kind and merciful, slow to anger and rich in compassion. He pardons all your iniquities, heals all your ills. He redeems your life from destruction, crowns you with kindness and compassion. The Lord is kind and merciful, slow to anger and rich in compassion. He will not always chide, nor does he keep his wrath forever. Not according to our sins does he deal with us nor does he requite us according to our crimes. The Lord is kind and merciful, slow to anger and rich in compassion. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so surpassing is his kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he put our transgressions from us. The Lord is kind and merciful, slow to anger and rich in compassion. Psalm 103 verses 1 to 2, 3 to 4, and 9 to 12. The Lord is kind and merciful, slow to anger, and rich in compassion. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all my being, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul and forget not all his benefits. He pardons all your iniquities, heals all your ills. He redeems your life from destruction, crowns you with kindness and compassion. He will not always chide, nor does he keep his wrath forever. Not according to our sins does he deal with us, nor does he requite us according to our crimes. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so surpassing is his kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he put our transgressions from us. In the first two verses we are told, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, means to worship him. O my soul, means from the deep part of our existence, our own soul. When we go to church are, we really worshipping as we should? Or are we going, observing the rituals, and mindlessly repeating prayers as the Pharisees did to gain the admiration of our friends and neighbors. At 29, 13 and 14, the Lord said, Since this people draws near with words only and honors me with their lips alone, though their hearts are far from me. 
and their reverence for me has become routine observance of the precepts of men. Therefore I will again deal with this people in surprising and wondrous fashion. The wisdom of its wise men shall perish, and the understanding of its prudent men be hid. As you can see God views this type of worship meaningless, lip service. It becomes just empty talk, without conviction, or intention. We need to pray, to worship with conviction, a firm belief in God's righteousness, love, and mercy toward all who worship from the depths of their soul. Dipping down to our soul, where the Holy Spirit lives, can we worship God, in the light of His Word. Verse 2 tells us why, do not forget all the gifts of God. We should worship by reaffirming our trust in the Lord to remove our sins from us as verse 12 to 13 tells us, as far as the east is from the west, so far have our sins been removed from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on the faithful. We ask for that forgiveness when we truly worship the Lord. Like other Psalms of David, Psalm 103, shows God's loving fatherly relationship with humanity. In today's reading we hear David's reasons for belief and his need to worship, which also extends to us. If we ask he will, pardon all your sins, heal all your ills. God heals all your ills physical, emotional, and spiritual. Only he can save us from hell, yet he does it with kindness and compassion. He doesn't seek revenge for our transgressions yet, he does take time to point us in the way of righteousness. Verse 12 as far as the east is from the west, so far has he put our trans transgressions from us. Why east to west instead of north to south? There is a limit to north and south. At some point you will cease traveling north and will be forced to move south. But east to west is unlimited, you can continually travel to the east and never have to change direction while you circle the world. world. God has put an everlasting separation between us and our past sins once we ask for his forgiveness. God is the father of all humanity and we should be grateful that he treats us with total love and compassion. Worship is so much more than the songs that we sing on Sunday morning, it is the life that we live the rest of the week. Romans 14 verses 7 to 9 We are not our own masters. We belong to the Lord, brothers and sisters, owe nothing to anyone, except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be, are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no evil to the neighbor, hence, love is the fulfillment of the law. The Error of Judging Others An elderly Chinese woman had two large pots, each hung on the ends of a pole, which she carried across her neck. One of the pots had a crack in it while the other pot was perfect and always delivered a full portion of water. At the end of the long walk from the stream to the house, the cracked pot arrived only half full. For a full two years this went on daily, with the woman bring home only one and a half pots of water. Of course, the perfect pot was proud of its accomplishments. But the poor cracked pot was ashamed of its own imperfection, and miserable that it could only do half of what it had been made to do. After two years of what it perceived to be bitter failure, it spoke to the woman one day by the stream. Ashamed of myself, because this crack in my side causes water to leak out all the way back to the house. The old woman smiled, did you notice that there are flowers on your side of the path, but not on the other pot's side? That's because I've always known about your flaw, so I planted the flower seeds on your side of the path, path, and every day while we walk back, you water them. For two years I have been able to pick these beautiful flowers to decorate the table. Without you being just the way you are, there would not be this beauty to grace the house. Each of us has our own unique flaw. But it's the cracks and flaws we each have that make our lives so interesting and rewarding. You've just got to take each person for what they are and look for the good in them. The woman in the story, just like God, uses what appears to the world to be our flaws with a greater purpose in mind. The fundamental reality of a Christian's life is that we belong to the Lord and the Lord alone is the judge who will decide our present value and our eternal reward. Matthew 7 verses 1 and 2, 
stop judging, that you may not be judged. For as you judge, so will you be judged, and the measure with which you measure will be measured out to you. Matthew 18 verses 21 to 35. I give you a new commandment, says the Lord, love one another as I have loved you. Peter approached Jesus and asked him, Lord, if my brother sins against me, how often must I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus answered, I say to you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. That is why the kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who decided to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the accounting, a debtor was brought before him who owed him a huge amount. Since he had no way of paying it back, his master ordered him to be sold, along with his wife, his children, and all his property, in payment of the debt. At that, the servant fell down, did him homage, and said, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back in full. Moved with compassion, the master of that servant let him go and forgave him the loan. When that servant had left, he found one of his fellow servants, who owed him a much smaller amount. He seized him and started to choke him, demanding, Pay back what you owe. Falling to his knees, his fellow servant begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he had the fellow servant put in prison until he paid back the debt. Now when his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were deeply disturbed and went to their master and reported the whole affair. His master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you your entire debt because you begged me to. Should you not have had pity on your fellow servant as I had pity on you? Then in anger, his master handed him over to the torturers until he should pay back the whole debt. So will my heavenly Father do to you, unless each of you forgives your brother from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord Peter asks the question how many times should I forgive my brother who has sinned against me? He suggests that seven times would be enough, keeping in mind that the number seven among Jews signified perfection. Within Judaism forgiving someone three times was all that was required and also proved you had a forgiving spirit. When Jesus says, seventy times seven, must have been amazed. How could you ever be able to recall the number of times you have forgiven your brother? Luke 17 verse 3, If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he wrongs you seven times in one day and returns to you seven times saying, I am sorry, you should forgive him. The point that Jesus is making with Peter, and to us as well, is that you shouldn't count the times you are willing to forgive but forgive endlessly when the sinner willingly repents of their sins. Jesus now expands on this forgiveness theme with a parable about a king settling accounts with his servants. The first servant owed 10,000 talents. A talent is the equivalent of 6,000 denarii or 20 years, 
7,300 days wages for a laborer. The second servant owed a hundred denarii and that was considered a minor debt because it represented only 100 days wages. Notice the king, an image of God, had tremendous compassion when he took pity on what seemed to be a repentant servant and forgave him his enormous debt. Keep in mind that the king was under no obligation to forgive the debt, but he chose to do so out of compassion or mercy. When the wicked servant was faced with the same situation he acted at an of the world and demanded total payment. When someone is given a great deal, a great deal will be demanded of that person. Like the king in the parable, God, through Jesus, will graciously forgive all of our sin debt, if we ask for his forgiveness. It is necessary for us to convert our heart so as to act with the same mercy and compassion of the king. Matthew 6 verses 14 to 15, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father also will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Forgiveness is the best form of love. It takes a strong person to say sorry and an even stronger person to forgive. The first to apologize is the bravest, the first to forgive is the strongest, the first to forget is the happiest. Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Until seven times? I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and children and all that he had, a payment to be made. And the servant therefore fell down, and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison that he should pay the debt. So, when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto the Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldst not thou have also had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly father do unto you. If ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother that trespasses. Let me tell you a story. There was a time when Jesus was speaking to the Apostle Peter and he told him this story.
The kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since the man couldn't repay the debt, the servant's master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold in order to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. The servant's master took pity upon him, canceled the debt and let him go. But when the servant went out, he saw one of his fellow servants that owed him 100 denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe, he demanded. The servant fell on his knees, began to beg him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused and instead he went off and had the man thrown into prison so that he could pay back all that he owed. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. They went to their master and told him everything. Then the master called in the servant. You wicked servant, he said. I cancel all of that debt of yours because you begged me to. So why couldn't you show mercy to your fellow servant just as I have shown mercy to you? In anger, the master turns him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay all that he owed. Good morning. Uh, if you notice the theme of all, all of the readings today is about sinners. So do we have any sinners out there? Come on, raise your hands. Come on, raise your hands. All of you, all of you. I, I did this one time and I asked them, do we have anybody that's not a sinner? And I had one woman raise her hand. And I said, really? And then she went, oh yes, and they blessed me. And I thought, oh, wow. I said, well, we have a Pharisee among us. <laughs> That's exactly what Jesus was all emphasizing in, in, in his, uh, when he talked to the Pharisees. People who thought they were a little bit better than everybody else but never realized their own sinfulness. And of course, today we hear the, the, this, this passage where Jesus is emphasizing that we are all sinners. And the reason why he comes is to relieve us of that, to forgive us. <coughs> Excuse me. We heard in this gospel, and I, I want to mention to you, I don't know how many times I have seen and heard people come up to me and saying, well, my sister or a friend of mine did me wrong, and I just can't forgive them. You know somebody like that? You know somebody that's holding on to that that angst that, that, that just is ruining them? And I always said, I even had some... Sometimes some of the programs that I've been dealing with, I've interviewed some, some celebrities. And I had one celebrity in particular, I remember, he said that he, his, he was, uh, it was in show business and his, his uh, manager ran, absconded most of his money. And he says, I was so angry for years, I just could not forgive him. And then he turned around and he says, then I realized it was a priest who told him, he says, if you don't forgive him, it'll eat you up. And he says, it's exactly what it was doing to me. It was eating me up inside to the point that I, I, I could never be happy. And that's a reminder to us of what Jesus is telling us. If we are to accept God's love and his mercy and forgiveness, we have to remember what mercy and forgiveness is about. And if we think that we're, you know, we're above that, then we, 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 we miss the boat. Completely. I particularly like this gospel in the sense that the passage is, uh, you're missing some of the nuances of this. First, he says that when, when Peter comes up to him and says, Lord, how much, much I, should I forgive my brother who's offended me or whatever? 
And he says seven times, which seven times, using the word seven, the numerology in, in the Old Testament, seven was the perfect number. So he thought he was like, you know, seven times? And Jesus says, oh no. He says, he's basically saying, you know, seven times is, is the, the great amount. But no, a thousand times that's seven times. That's what he's really saying to him. He says, eternally. And so he's really saying that 77 is really meaning, you know, way above what the perfect is. He says, constant forgiveness. And then he, then he proceeds to tell us a story about, you know, that you've heard this, this, this parable. Yeah, I'm sure you have, over and over again. And, you know, a lot of times we, we miss the nuances of this parable in the sense that we hear that the man who, who was owed a great, it says uh, he owed a great amount. Well, the translation is in, slightly incorrect there because in the translation it sort of says that he's had several thousand talents. And I've looked at numerous scholars and we, every single one of them responds. In this, in this the day and age, that the several thousand of talents that he owed the king would have been probably in this day and every single one of them said the same amount. About two billion dollars. That's a large amount. Boy, I want to know what this guy was doing. I, mean, I don't want to know. He must have been really working it out really, really good. And I think he says, and then you know, this is what the, the, um, the scholars said. So it's, it's a massive amount. And I think that's what we, we have to hold on to because that's, that's what we owe God. That's what that, the emphasis is trying to tell us. Our sins and our failures, the things that we have, uh, have responded against the Lord, how much do we owe him? And he, well, how much has he given us? And Jesus dying on the cross, how much is that worth to us? How much is it a, you know, <coughs> excuse me. I heard, I heard one, uh, one preacher on, on television you know, just the other day, and he says, you know, he says, if you, when you think about this, how much, much we owe the Lord, if I, he says, if I were you to invite you all here today and say, you know, if you come to church next Sunday, I'll give you each a, a couple million dollars. We'd have, he says, I'll have a line all the way stretched down around the, around the thing, and in, even in hopes that somebody, even when I ran out of money, that somebody might get a little bit of the extra. But, you know, what you're getting here is far more than any money, amount of money can, can, can be offered to you. And it's, we have to realize that, what God has given us. And that's how much we owe him. So he says that this is, this is the amount that he owed. And what is the, and the servant, he says, you know, in those days, you know, when you owed somebody, you know, you know, if you couldn't pay it, you went off to jail. Well, and really what, you, what happens is you were set, sold into slavery to pay up for the amount. And so what is the, the king says, well, I'm going to sell you, your wife, your children, everything, all of them is your family to make up for this amount. And of course, the man kneels down and cries and says, please forgive me. He asks for forgiveness. He asks for sorrow. He shows, he sees the, the, the sorrow and the king recognizes, shows compassion and love. The prime purpose of God's love. And that love is there and he, just, uh, I, and he forgives him. It's, it's the, so what does this guy do? He doesn't, he doesn't grasp hold of what that great forgiveness is. He goes off and sees his neighbor, and it says a lot lesser amount. Well, the scholars point out that the lot lesser amount would have been in this day and age, as compared to two billion, about 5,000. Whoa. This guy throws him in jail, does everything else, tries to strangle him and everything. Is that the way we treat what our brothers and sisters? Is that how we respond to those who have offended us? That's not how God has responded to us. The message is quite clear. How we are called to deal with each other. If we, are to, if we don't show the love of God, if we don't show the love of God, then how can we accept his love? That's so, so important for us to see. Because if we truly accept God's love, we become more like him. I tell the story, I told this several years ago, and it was, uh, 
I was invited to, to a dinner party at a friend's house, a former parishioner, and it was a very elegant party, you know, the tablecloths and the crystal was on the table and that. And I'm sort of a boisterous person, you know? And I'm telling this story and I knocked over the wine glass. Well, it goes into the, to the, the, uh, the spinach. The spinach was floating in a mess. But I broke the glass and everything else. And she, the, the hostess got up with, ah, like this. And she was all bent out of shape. And she was putting on cloths and everything. Else. And well, I don't think I've ever was invited to get back again. <laughs> um, and, I, and, I'm not, and I just think... Uh, you know, sometimes we have to re realize that these, the aspect of forgiveness, and I'm not condemning this woman or anything else, but the aspect of forgiveness follows every aspect of our lives. And I'm reminded because a similar thing occurred when I was a deacon. We, were, I was, we had a visiting priest at the, at the rectory at the time, and I, the rectory I was working at as a deacon. And, and uh, one of the priests there knocked over his, his glass, and it was a Waterford and he broke it. And he says, oh, I hope that wasn't that expensive stuff. And the pastor knew darn well it was. And he turned around and said, oh, that's that cheap stuff. It's, it's, uh, it's always wobbly. And I thought, oh, wow, how gracious. And that's exactly how we, we should be responding to, to what those who offend us. The graciousness of care and love. Say sharing the love of God in, in whatever we do, even when it hurts us. Because let's face it. This hurricane this past week taught us a lesson. What's most important in our lives? Not, a, not the, the possessions that we have, not the cars, not the, the furniture, not anything except our lives. That's the first mo and most important thing. And, that, and even beyond that, our relationship with God and how we show the love of God. That's most important. And that should be the paramount thing and how we guide our lives. I told that story last, last night and I had a gentleman telling me, he said, well, if we ever invite you to the house, Father, that means that we're going to put and hide the, the, the crystal, okay? The Nature of True Forgiveness Are you willing to forgive? Jesus tells a story about the nature of true forgiveness. The servant who owed ten thousand talents was in more debt than any of us, we hope, will ever be. One talent was worth about six thousand days work. It would have taken this man thirteen year teen years, working six days a week, to earn one talent. He owed ten thousand of them. How could a servant get in that kind of trouble? Was he stealing from the treasury? Did he make a bad investment? We don't know and it doesn't matter to the story. What we do know is that he owed a gigantic amount nothing with which to pay it. It would have been understandable if his king had laughed in his face, when he begged to be given time to repay his debt in full. He would have had to live 130,000 years and put every dime he earned into his debt to pay it off. The man was a fool no matter how you look at it and the king easily could have reacted in anger. Yet the king was moved with compassion and let the servant go, debt free. The king not only was compassionate, but he understood the magnitude of the servant's problem. There was no way the king was going to get paid, so he simply forgave the servant. Not much later this same servant found one of his peers who owed him little money, about three months work. Yet the one who had been forgiven many lifetimes worth of debt grabbed this debtor by the neck and demanded. Pay me what you owe me. When the indebted servant couldn't immediately pay, the forgiven servant had him thrown in prison. As soon as the other servants heard what had happened, they took king, who called the evil man on the carpet, blasted him, and gave him the full punishment he deserved. The king represents God. The forgiven servant represents all of us. We owe a debt of sin we could not possibly repay. Our little attempts to pay our debt would be like those of the servant offering to pay his huge debt. It's ridiculous. We simply don't have the ability to pay. And yet, because of his great love, God forgave us our astronomical debt. Now the question is, 
will we be like the evil servant? Someone who wants to take all the forgiveness God can give. Are we unwilling to give someone else the same kind of unconditional forgiveness that God gives us? Do we want to lock our unforgiven, in the prison of silence? Do we want to lock them in the prison of shunning? Does Jesus mean that non-forgiveness indicates an unrepentant, obstinate, or stubborn heart? If we remain un remain unwilling to forgive our friends and enemies, does that mean we have never truly come to faith in Christ? WWJD What would Jesus do? We must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power to love. There is some good in the worst and some evil in the best of us. When we discover this, we are less prone to hate our enemies. Martin Luther King Jr. This is a homily for the 24th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. Last Sunday I pointed out that Matthew's Gospel arranges the teaching of Jesus into five discourses. Why has Matthew done that? Keep in mind that Matthew's community included many Jews. The fact that they'd accepted Jesus as the Messiah didn't mean that they were no longer Jews. Quite the contrary. They believed that Jesus the Messiah had brought their Jewish faith to its fulfillment. Now for a Jew, the heart and soul of God's revelation to his people is the Torah the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So by arranging the teaching of Jesus into five discourses, Matthew subtly mirrors these five books of Moses. And by doing that, he's telling his readers that the Torah finds its fulfillment in the teaching of Jesus. Last Sunday, we began reading from the fourth of these five discourses. And this fourth discourse is devoted to our life together as a Christian community. So last Sunday's Gospel offered some guidelines to follow when a member of the community had done something wrong and needed to be called to order. Today's Gospel is about forgiveness. Peter asks Jesus, Lord, how often must I forgive my brother if he wrongs me? Now, before giving Jesus a chance to reply, Peter offers his own suggestion. As often as seven times. Now, I'm sure that Peter considered that extravagantly generous, especially since there's no mention of repentance by the offending party. But Jesus replied, not seven, I tell you, but seventy-seven times. Jesus isn't talking about mathematics, but about the nature of forgiveness. The kind of forgiveness called for is beyond all calculation. It's limitless. And to make this point, Jesus tells a story. This parable is the story about a king who decides to settle his accounts with his servants. And a servant is brought before him who owes 10,000 talents. Now this servant would undoubtedly have been a high official, perhaps something like a provincial governor. The servant has no way of paying the debt. So the king orders that the servant and his whole family and all his possessions should be sold in order to meet the debt. Selling the man into slavery would recover virtually none of the loss, but it may have abated some of the king's anger. But the man throws himself at his master's feet. Give me time and I will pay the whole sum. Now the whole sum is 10,000 talents. It's so astronomical a debt that the servant 
would have had no way of repaying it. To give you an idea of the enormity of the sum, the total amount of income tax collected in all of King Herod's territories amounted to 900 talents. Now, a talent isn't an amount of money, it is in fact a weight. One talent weighs 20.4 kilograms, and it was usually a weight of silver. So one talent of silver in Australian dollars would today be worth about $25,000. So 10,000 talents is worth about $255 million today. But that amount doesn't really capture the enormity of the debt. A talent was the largest unit of currency at that time. And 10,000 was the largest single number the Greek language could then express. So Jesus is making the parable particularly graphic. Well, the master feels sorry for the man and cancels the entire debt. Now that was something totally unexpected and striking. One could imagine the audience bursting out in laughter. Who ever heard of such extravagant and absurd generosity? Now the servant who just had an unpayable debt totally wiped out happens to meet a fellow servant who owes him 100 denarii. He seizes him by the throat and begins to throttle him, demanding payment. The fellow servant pleads for more time to repay the debt, but to no avail. He is thrown into prison until he should pay the debt. Now, a denarius is a day's wage. In other words, the amount a labourer earned for a day's work. Now, the basic wage in Australia is $19.84 per hour. So if you worked an eight-hour day, that would amount to $158.72. So that's roughly what a denarius is worth in today's currency. 100 denarii, therefore, is worth $15,872. It's not an insignificant amount, but it's microscopic in comparison to 10,000 talents. The man begs for time to repay the debt, but to no avail. He's thrown into prison until he should pay the debt. Now his fellow servants were deeply distressed at what had just happened, and they reported the matter to the master. The master is furious. I cancelled all that debt of yours when you appealed to me. Were you not bound to have pity on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And he's handed over to the torturers until he should pay the entire debt. The disparity between the two amounts is staggering. $255 million against 15,872. The force of the parable rests on this comparison. As disciples of Jesus, we have received, as a result of Christ's costly generosity, remission of a debt, the debt of sin, a debt that we ourselves could never repay. How utterly inappropriate, then, is an unwillingness to forgive others who, on a vastly smaller scale, have offended us. The English biblical scholar Tom Wright puts it this way, the kingdom that Jesus preached and lived was all about a glorious, uproarious, absurd generosity. Sister Helen Prejean's book, Dead Man Walking, an eyewitness account of the death penalty was published in 1994. Dead Man Walking refers to Sister Helen's ministry. She offers pastoral presence to prisoners condemned to death. So these condemned prisoners are the walking dead. 
Sister Helen began her prison ministry in 1981. And how did she get into such a ministry? Well, she began writing to Patrick Sonia, a death row prisoner sentenced to die in the electric chair for killing two teenagers. At Sonia's request, she began to visit him regularly as his spiritual advisor. Over the past 20 years, she's accompanied many prisoners during the lead-up to their execution. But Sister Helen soon realised that there was another group who also needed her help, and they were the families of the victims of the crimes these men had committed. Sister Helen is the founder of Survive, which is a victim's advocacy group in New Orleans. And she continues to counsel not only inmates on death row, but also the families of murder victims as well. Speaking of the families of murder victims, she says, their first reaction is one of rage, loss, and wanting to retaliate. Asked if they want the death penalty, they unequivocally say, yes, I'd like to pull a switch myself. I'd like to kill this person with my bare hands. The parents of one young girl who was abducted into the woods, raped and stabbed and left to bleed to death were present at the execution of their daughter's murderer. After the execution, the media was waiting to interview them. They were asked, How do you feel now? You've waited for five years for this moment. And the father replied, He died too quick. I hope he burns in hell. Sister Helen was also present at the execution and thought to herself, If these people could watch Robert, the executed murderer, die every week, a thousand thousand times they could watch him die, when they come home, they have to deal with the empty chair. You have to deal with the fact that you've lost your daughter. And even killing the one who killed her still doesn't deal with the basic loss that you've experienced. And that is the spiritual journey that you have to make. It's Sister Helen's experience that the desire for vengeance is usually the first step of the journey of every victim's family. She's noticed that almost all of the people that she meets don't stay there, harbouring a desire for vengeance. They don't stay there because it begins to be too costly for them. A counterpart of Sister Helen's Dead Man Walking is the powerful story of forgiving the unforgivable told by Debbie Morris. She's the author of Forgiving the Dead Man Walking. At the age of 16, Debbie and her boyfriend were kidnapped by two men, and over a period of 36 hours they tortured and shot her boyfriend, leaving him for dead, and they raped her repeatedly before finally letting her go. For Debbie, there was nothing harder than forgiveness, but nothing more urgent. The unforgiveness that I was holding on to, the hate, the anger, was destroying my life. I was continuing to let these men have control over me. I was continuing to let myself be victimized because I was hanging on to the hate. I was unwilling to forgive. Initially, she felt that justice would bring healing. She kept looking forward to certain milestones, the capture of the two men, then the trial, and then the sentence was handed down, they're guilty, and finally the execution of one of the men. But justice is not what healed Debbie. When I was able to forgive, not only did the hate, anger and pain go away, but the shame did too. When I chose to forgive, there was a prisoner that was set free. 
and I realised that that prisoner was myself. An apt metaphor for the cost of harbouring feelings of vengeance is a jellyfish called Medusa. Now it's found in the Bay of Naples. I'm relying here on Lewis Thomas's book entitled The Medusa and the Snail. Thomas tells us that the jellyfish swallows the slug of a snail of the nudie branch variety and draws it into its digestive tract. A pleasant snack. But then the slug slowly begins to eat the jellyfish from the inside out, and by, by the time the snail is fully grown, it has devoured the entire jellyfish. Burp! And the desire for vengeance will likewise devour us unless we each forgive our brother or sister from the heart. <laughs>